Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. I guess we're moderatorless, so uh, we'll just kick this off without any good, uh, get going here. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming out to the presentation today. Um, where we're going, we won't need passwords. Um, quick introduction uh, for myself. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Haida, and I'm a technical architect at USAA. Um, I've got a lot of background in different areas of security, everything from Active Directory to cryptography, web application security. Uh, most recently, I've been focusing on identity and access management technologies at USAA, I'm primarily on the technical side. I'm Mike Stewart. I'm uh, the executive director in charge of identity and access management at USAA, so I have all the workforce identity and access management and host and database security at USAA. So uh, Matt and I partner up on this stuff, and he's kind of the DJ and I'm the rapper. So. <laughs> And uh, kind of a quick background, um, who here has heard of USAA before? Okay, good. So about 10, 12 years ago, we used to ask that question. Very few people raised their hands uh, before we had TV commercials and were broadcasting out. Um, USAA is a unique uh, financial services organization. Um, we start every um, meeting and every PowerPoint presentation at USAA with our mission slide. As a member of an organization that caters to the military, this is what we're really about. Uh, the mission is to facilitate the financial security of its members, associates, and their families through a provision of highly competitive financial products and services. In so doing, USAA seeks to be the provider of choice for the military community. So the question is, why are we out here, right? Um, and the idea here behind sharing this information is that we want to make the security ecosystem stronger. Um, ultimately, we are, as a member of an organization, um, highly incentivized to keep our member information secure. And by doing that, we want you to come back, take this information to your organizations, and use it to in, uh, implement multi-factor authentication for your workforce. Um, we do have um, quite a few slides here that'll kind of break it down, but if you have questions, just interrupt. We're going to try to be interactive. Um, and, and keep in mind that uh, we aren't uh, public speakers full-time. Uh, we are practitioners, and that's really why we wanted to come out and speak to you today, because uh, we've done this, we're in the real world actually implementing it, and we want to try to help um, push you to do this in your organization as well. Um, just a high level um, overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, really, it's the people, process, and technology around implementing workforce multi factor authentication. Um, but we're going to go backwards since I get to speak first on the technology side. And um, what are we doing to kind of retrofit an organization that has been in place for almost 100 years? Uh, we've got mainframe systems that have been put in place before I was born that are still working and um, uh, providing capabilities to our business. So um, transitioning all of those to a passwordless environment has been quite a challenge. Um, so I'll talk about the technology and what we're playing first. And then Mike is going to um, jump in and talk about kind of the people and process and what he's doing to help um, roll this out to the enterprise. Um, so first, kind of we're, we're already started at USA right now. Um, massive um, Active Directory infrastructure. Um, for privileged users, we've already rolled out multi-factor many, many years ago. Um, but what we're talking about today is more for the, uh, the workforce, the, the general population workforce. Um, when they do access our systems externally, it's all multi-factor authentication, but it's not very convenient. Um, we'd still username and password and um, a, uh, a one-time access code. And it really comes in two form factors, right? It's either the keychain version with a six-digit code that you have to key in, or it's the um, mobile phone application. That's it. It's not a very good user experience. And as a result, it's always a pain uh, that people complain about. So um, the other thing, too, I'll, I'll mention is that uh, we've, we've removed as many uh, vendor um, contacts as we could throughout our presentation. We're going to try not to bring those out because we really wanted this to be a little bit more um, agnostic. But if you have any questions um, about some of the technologies you use, you can see me afterwards. I can help. Yes? It's just the, um, the, the fact that you have to pull it out and wait for the 30-second code. And as a result, you always constantly have to be on the keyboard. Um, and the fact that you don't know whether or not it was your password that you miskeyed or whether or not it was the one-time access code. And um, after a couple attempts, you start locking out the account, which is, especially when they were externally facing, causes a bit of a headache because they have to call the help desk and it turns into a 20-minute you know, recovery process. So that was the main pain point that we were trying to remove. And um, Mike will speak to this here, but that was a lot of the, um, I guess, opposition that we were facing internally when we say that we're going to bring in multi-factor authentication all the time anywhere. People immediately think of the six-digit code they have to key in, and, uh, and they're really afraid of that. 
So um, this is what it looks like right now. Again, it's just a one-time access code. But what we've added out to the environment is working with several different vendors to collect together uh, a myriad of options for our employees to use. So on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, what we've rolled out is um, keeping the same mobile options, but uh, we have the mobile one-time code, broadening, also adding in mobile push capabilities, be able to push directly to the phone. Um, the use of mobile biometrics, um, again, being able to use um, whatever device is capable there. And what we're most excited about is uh, mobile proximity capability. So working with one of our vendors to be able to uh, pair the phone with the uh, workstation. So as long as it's within range of the computer, similar to a keyless car scenario, we can use that as a factor for authentication. For, um, so we, this will be um, the, the primary and best user experience possible is using the mobile capabilities. And most of our workforce is very uh, mobile capable. They always have their phone um, standing by. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the capabilities that we're rolling out for the non-member contact. And Mike will talk to you a little bit um, why we have to do this later, but we still have um, large populations that um, either don't want to use their mobile phone for business work or they're not eligible for our um, BYD mobile program. So we still um, are using employee badges through um, RFID and uh, also retaining the same physical one-time access code that they can use when they're um, VPN remotely. And um, kind of interesting uh, for, uh, for our workforce as well, we're, we're issuing out USB FIDO tokens. Um, if you're not familiar with the, um, the FIDO token, it's an alliance for frictionless identity online. It's kind of a universal standard for devices to be able to communicate um, with a web browser um, with a little small cryptographic um, hardware security module. Um, and this is, uh, is really exciting for us because it enables us to uh, provide recovery options for the users when they don't have um, either option with them. So um, again, the thing to keep in mind as we, as we brief this internally is that most people, when they, when they roll this out, they don't worry about the good experiences, right? They don't, every time you log into the computer, when everything's working great, it's not a problem, right? When the one-time access code is working fine and the password's working and they've got muscle memory down, it's not an issue. Uh, what we spend a lot of time focusing on from the design perspective is um, outside of that bubble, right? It's the onboarding process of identity verification and how do you bootstrap somebody in for multi-factor authentication. Um, the credential unlock and reissuance is another um, critical <laughs> component. Michael, Michael speak to some of the work we're doing over there. Um, step up authentication and emergency access, right? Um, and of course, termination process. It doesn't have to be a great experience, but uh, we try to make that as easy as possible as well. Okay, so um, a high-level review of the, the technology components that we put in place here. This is, uh, this is what we call architecture at USAA, so um, it's a little bit abstracted later, but it helps people understand what our, uh, what our environment looks like. Kind of on the left-hand side, we've consolidated over the last several years at USAA to Citrix virtual desktops. Although we still have quite a few physical workstations in the environment, um, we're migrating everyone we can over to Citrix PDIs. And uh, that has actually been helped our journey and also provided a lot of challenges from an experience perspective. Um, in, in the olden days, you know, two years ago and, and beyond, we owned the entire physical workstation and there were domain joint devices, so we could control the experience um, all the way down, right? As we start centralizing everything to the virtual environment, it's nice because the user has the same computer everywhere they go. Um, but we have less control over what devices are actually connected to the computer, and we can't control the experience aspects. So. Um, but coming to the left-hand side, we, we've got uh, mobile phones and tablets, and we're starting to see a lot more of our organization um, use those for their primary um, in, in point because of the battery. Um, we also have USA managed laptops. So for example, I've got a um, USA device here that it's non-domain joined. It um, is managed separately outside of the domain. And so I can use that for as a BYOD device and also for business work. And then uh, we still have uh, some people who actually use their home personal computers. So for example, I use my uh, uh, personal MacBook when I go home and then I use this sometimes on the weekends or I'll be using it when I'm uh, uh, at the office. The nice thing is that all of those are connecting into the same Citrix that scale environment, which is what enables us to control this experience and make it the same, whether or not you're at home or at work. Um, all of those, uh, like I said, pipe in through um, the central authentication um, option um, system in the middle. And the two protocols uh, that, that have really made this possible are SAML 
and radius authentication. So I'm going to, this is kind of a high level overview and then I'm going to jump into each one of these components to see uh, what it makes it up. Okay, so what are the challenges that we face when we roll this out? Again, speaking of this, USA is a 100 year old company and um, we've got quite a bit of um, devices that have been plugged in for a while. We do have a modern infrastructure. Um, normally when an organization gets to our size, it's from merger and acquisition. Uh, in our case, it's organic growth, right, to get up to well over 30,000 employees. So the good thing is all of our devices are fairly uniform environment, but we have to lift them all up at the same environment. So um, we do have a pretty wide range of devices, um, about 80,000 domain join Windows desktops and laptops, also a growing force of Mac OS X devices, um, consolidating all into the Citrix virtual desktop environment. Uh, the other challenge we have is that we have a BYOD uh, program in place, both for uh, handheld for iPhone and Android devices, as well as, again, things like um, using your own um, Apple iPads or I iPad Pros, et cetera. And uh, again, iOS, Android, mobile devices. We have a lot of differences between versions on Android, whether or not they can support biometrics, um, how quickly they're getting security patches out, et cetera. The other challenge we had from a technology perspective is um, a lot of the multi-factor authentication vendors that are out there in the environment, I think we did a research effort, and this is um, a project really two, three years in the making. Um, we've looked at probably 20 or 30 different vendors, right? Every technology that's out there, we've looked at, and we found almost all of them are focused on adding a um, second factor on top of the password, right? Very few are actually looking at killing the password completely. That was really important for us as we rolled this out because in order to get really adoption for our workforce, we had to give a selling point to them, right? We didn't want to come in and say, hey, we're adding this capability to you. We're coming in from a marketing perspective and say, hey, we're killing the password. You hate it. We hate it, right? That you're gonna have to carry something around, but it's gonna be a better experience for you. Uh, the reception has been really well received on that. Okay. So um, again, the way we tackled this is, uh, is really a lot of coordination with our IT operations team. We spent years uh, working with them to make sure that as the technologies that are bringing in, we had um, a good understanding of what the capabilities were and they would be forward compatible. And also helping them um, assist in funding and consulting. So we used a lot of our dollars within security to help um, bring in consultants on their side to see what it would be necessary to, uh, to bring a passwordless authentication experience for them and um, in integrating their um, software. Um, migrating all the authentication touch points to SAML authentication has really been um, the defining success for us. I started looking at this maybe 15 years ago, and again, every couple of years, for the last 15 years, we've looked at how we can roll out multi-factor authentication. And 15 years ago, it was really just with uh, smart card authentication, right? So you'd have to buy readers out to all of our workforce, um, have to jam it in, keep it with them at all times and uh, it wasn't a good user experience. Uh, the exciting part for us has been uh, with SAML authentication, it's consolidating everything into a centralized identity access management platform. We can now uh, control that experience, build a SAML assertion out to these different infrastructure devices, and uh, it is more of like a universal support. So the first step was really uh, taking the Citrix NetScaler and uh, upgrading that to use SAML authentication. Right now, it's on radius authentication. And so um, there are other organizations that are doing that that involved um, several different components within our environment, all upgrading at the same time to support SAML. Um, again, we touched on this, but the, the great thing about SAML authentication, again, is that right now, we have a specific vendor that we use uh, that we're rotating into another one. By, by bringing it into a centralized identity access management platform, we can change out vendors, right, for individual user populations, so they can use the best product for them that serves their needs without making any additional changes to the infrastructure over time. So uh, that's been really beneficial to us. And also, um, it really provided the foundation for Windows Hello and the uh, FIDO authentication. Um, with uh, Microsoft Passport and some of the new technologies that are coming over the next several years, we wanted to be forward compatible with that. Okay, and so uh, kind of a little bit deeper um, dive here on the left-hand side. You can see our, the environment before we uh, made changes were uh, we had a v the legacy VPN environment, um, virtual desktop environment, and things like the privilege access system, all in the uh, Radius authentication server. And we had started consolidating on a centralized access manager solution. 
and uh, of course, self self service password reset again was all using the uh, the one time password authentication infrastructure. What we've done is now shift everything into one central location using SAML. Uh, the VDIs now go through that, and the privilege access system, mobile applications, and self-service self password reset, all focus on that one single component, which is fantastic because, again, we can, we can change that experience in an agile approach without making any changes to our backend infrastructure now. Uh, one of the other big challenges that we had is that um, although we had an existing um, technology standard, and we still do for single sign-on for all of our applications, uh, it still allowed LDAP authentication because it had been in place for you know, 15, 20 years. And so as a result, a lot of the applications that were brought in, thousands of them were brought in over time, and they would take it out of the box, they would integrate it to our environment. Most of them chose to use Kerberos, but some of them would plug it into the environment and they would use an LDAP authentication out to Active Directory. There was still a username password prompt, so technically it did meet the single sign-on classification, but it wasn't a really good experience. Um, so this has been a huge uh, challenge for us to roll out the passwordless authentication. So our action plan for that is really, um, number one, starting with a good solid inventory of every application at USAA. Um, we have a, a technology portfolio management application that inventories every application at use. So what we did is work with the team to modify that, add additional questions and, and clarification on how does your application authenticate to the environment, which for security professionals, um, generally we know terms like SAML and Kerberos. What we found is that when we went out to um, the rest of the IT environment, they didn't know what that meant, right? They didn't know the difference between authentication and authorization. So we had to do a lot of um, teaching to them to explain the difference on that and the nuances. Um, so it was a pretty big information gathering exercise to determine the protocols in use. And then every single application, we've had to go through an action plan and work with them to upgrade the environment. Some of them, it was easy, it was easy enough of uh, actually upgrading them and moving them over to Kerberos authentication, which provides the best experience for them. There's no passwords involved. If they're not Kerberos compatible, we'll switch them over to using SAML authentication, and most of the modern technologies can do SAML. If not, we can find a way to make it work. And worst case is uh, we invested in a, a password stuffing tool, and so the password is still there behind the scenes. We're rotating it and maintaining it for them on their behalf, but as soon as the application comes up, we just key the username password in for the user, and, and they move on. So. Um, we don't like doing that. It's really just kind of kicking the can down further down the road. At some point, we have to get that application upgraded so we don't have to rotate that password, but it has enabled us to uh, push this journey forward. So again, another high-level view now um, of, of what we've done here. Moved everything into uh, the, the NetScaler using SAML authentication, and then on the right-hand side, um, Kerberos, SAML, and Password Vault in order to access the applications. Okay, so Mike's going to talk a little bit about um, how we actually took the technology, and this is all fairly simple, right? Again, it's, um, it's a lot of work, and it's tremendously complicated to list, lift all this legacy stuff over, but the really hard part is actually rolling this out to the enterprise when you actually start uh, working with individuals. So technology doesn't get to have opinions, which is really nice, but we have lots of people at USA, and they all have opinions. Yeah. So that's where we run into some hurdles and some roadblocks as we start to roll this out. Um, so one of the big challenges, and Matt had touched this briefly, was recovery, the last mile problem. What happens, and it may or may not have happened to me at one point, where it's a Saturday afternoon, I have my iPhone, it's in my bathing suit pocket, and I jump in the pool, and I say, crap, I don't have my iPhone anymore, it's an inconvenience for me, and I forget to get a new one, and I go to work on Monday morning, and I can't get into anything, because that was the only way I could authenticate to the network. So that was a challenge for us. Um, we had to, it, until you get to multiple second factors, it really is hard to have a recovery option, and that was where, what drove us to have all of those different factors, and really the break glass option of issuing everybody in the enterprise a FIDO token. So that if everything else fails, you have a hard token, and you can use that so that we don't have to use single factor authentication to get your multi-factor authentication back up and working. Um, so and Mike, I'll, just, I'll speak to that too. The other one is really important. So uh, about two years ago, um, we, we spent a lot of work with our help desk and actually killed all knowledge-based authentication, right? So a lot of um, help desks still have uh, last four of your social or last four of your uh, 
um, or mother's main name or some other knowledge-based authentication, we decided that wasn't going to be secure enough for uh, the workforce. We killed it all across the board, which is kind of what uh, backed us into this problem where now that we've killed the password and we've killed all the knowledge-based authentication, it really is critical to have your phone with you on all times. And really the way we've been pitching this inside the, uh, the organization is not just knowledge-based authentication, but any static identifier. Right. We're on a mission to eliminate all static identifiers at USAA. If it's not dynamic, if we can't change it, if we can't rotate it, we don't want it to be used as an authenticator uh, to get onto the USA network. Uh, and then the last mile, if I, my dog eats my token, I've lost my phone, and all kinds of other things happen, what do we do? Well, the, the process that we've put in place, which is a little bit clunky, is peer vouching. So I lose everything. I go to Matt. I say, Matt, you know it's me. You need to use your second factor to authenticate yourself to the service desk. Vouch for me to re-enroll all of my authentication options. So other uh, organizational challenges. So workforce are accustomed to using multi-factor authentication. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we are on the path right now to, we won't eliminate secrets. What we will do is make them unknown to the user. So what happens if somebody follows somebody else's phone token and now they're identifying themselves as a person where the secret would at least as a second. So like when you have one time token, mm -hmm. you need to compare that with something you know so that being said, we do require a PIN. So it's technically, we, we haven't eliminated all secrets. We have a PIN. So it's- That's right, it's still a second factor. It's yep. still a second factor. Your password actually still exists too, but it's behind the scenes. You don't know what it is. We make it as complex as we can, and we rotate it as often as we want to. Um, so but again, that, that, that is one of the reasons that we issued out the FIDO token as well. So keep in mind, especially in the, in the scenario we're talking about where you do have to call the help desk for a peer vouching capability, um, that's really a tactical approach right now. And we're rolling out FIDO tokens out to the entire enterprise so that they have self-service capabilities. Uh, Mike jumps in the pool and um, wipes out his iPhone. He can go to the Apple store on Saturday. What's that? They're waterproof now. Waterproof now, that's true, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to test it <laughs> thousand or twelve hundred dollars now for the iPhone X. I'm not going to test anything. But um, yeah, if you, if you were to lose your phone or you have a problem with that, you can log in the next day on a Sunday and um, use your FIDO token, which does have a second factor. There's still a pin and uh, your FIDO token. Now you can uh, remove your old iPhone and add a new one back in without calling the help desk at all. So um, as we continue the rollout to the enterprise and everyone does have those devices, we're going to um, also remove that capability as well. So. The big one of the challenges for us was to make the MFA experience something that people were comfortable with in office. So people are used to using multi-factor to authenticate for, for as a remote user. Um, it was a little bit more challenging for us to get them comfortable with being multi-factored in the office for an in-office experience. So the way we did that is to try to you know, make it as, as smooth and seamless as possible and actually make it better for them. Um, as Matt talked about some of the options. Um, and, you know, people are used to wearing a badge when they come in the office. They're used to having to bring physical factors to get into the building. So we've tried to tie it to that. In fact, badging is one of the options for folks that don't want to carry a phone um, or don't want to use their phone. And we'll talk a little bit about that, too. So we have a workforce of about 55,000 people. Some amount of those people are either contact center staff third-party users, people that work in secure rooms that are not allowed to have uh, uh, phones with them when they're at their desk. So the way we um, actually addressed that was to um, either allow them to use the FIDO token, allow them to use a badge as an authenticator along with a PIN. So we gave them options that were not just phone-based. So Matt talked about having the mobile users and the non-mobile users. That was one of our biggest challenges. And quite frankly, one of our noisiest constituencies are our, our call, center pro program, uh, call center employees. And rightfully so, because they're the folks that service our members and they need to have seamless, smooth access. And every minute that they're down is a minute that one of our members is not getting serviced. So we sp focus a lot of time and effort on making sure that they have a smooth and seamless uh, experience. 
So we have a whole slew of designers, uh, UI designers, design architects, experience architects that we've engaged throughout this process that have helped us to design the experience. So we've gotten them in at the ground floor. We've worked with them to make sure that this works for the, the number of constituencies that we have. Uh, right now, we're in the process of doing a number of road shows. Um, I pretty much have to talk to every executive, I think, at USAA to convince them that this is a good idea and explain to them what makes this work for them. And really, the thing that resonates most with them is every month we have about 8,000 password-related calls that go to our service desk. And those calls take some number of minutes. And when you add up those minutes, those minutes add up to dollars. Um, and that resonates with our executives as I go around and start to talk to, about, talk to them about that. So by giving folks a self-service option and reducing the pain associated with changing passwords, we've actually been able to get folks on board. Um, and we've, had, uh, we've tried to make the training uh, self-service and easy and tailored to the individual and the experience that they want. So we have some general training videos that are like a minute and a half long. So they, you're not, we're not forcing somebody to sit down and go through some 30-minute computer-based training on how to use multi-factor authentication. Um, and so after the general video, based on the options that you choose, you can watch another minute and a half video that talks to you about how do I use my phone as an authenticator, how do I register my phone as a device. We've made a self-service portal that allows you to go in and register and manage your, manage your authenticators just like you would um, for any number of sites out there that we all manage our authenticators. So it's an experience that folks are used to outside of the enterprise. We're trying to make it as good as that experience inside the enterprise. Go ahead. So I have about 5,000 Bluetooth readers sitting in my office. Um, uh, we have uh, several thousand badge readers. Yeah. Um, that allow for uh, RFID to work on the machines. Um, so we have purchased those. Actually, the Bluetooth readers are reasonably inexpensive. The badge readers get a little pricey, more like $35, $40 a piece. Um, and, and that's why we really try to focus on the experience and the excitement around using the mobile capabilities, because that provides the best experience possible. And so the readers are only $5 a piece for adding the Bluetooth um, components to that. So um, the answer is no. They, they don't have universal support, but we try to lead people down that path as much as we can. We kind of sell it as a red pill, blue pill, and we really encourage people to go on the red pill path, which is to have the mobile experience. If not, yes, we'll issue you out a badge reader that you can use your RFID badge on, but it's not going to be the best experience possible. And again, over time, as we start um, consolidating um, people over the mobile options, I think it's going to greatly reduce the number of badges that we still have to use. Um, what we have found with the, the FIDO tokens is that um, they are you know, USB, and now with USB-C um, connectivity over the maps, um, they have universal support because they're just read in as keyboards. So they pretty much work almost everywhere uh, that we've needed them to. I'll say, and, and lastly, sort of as we've rolled this out, as you know, the people, we found it important. Um, we're starting with our IT organization, which is about 4,000 folks. Um, in part because if we can get all the service desk folks and all the IT folks on board, um, they'll be big champions for us uh, rolling it out across the rest of the enterprise. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, by the end of this year, our entire IT area at USA, so about 4,000-ish people, will be fully multi-factored, won't be uh, using passwords to authenticate at USAA. We have uh, another year or so left on our journey to move to the entire enterprise. But it's uh, been pretty well received, and uh, you know it's it's been an, uh, an interesting journey. Yeah, and I think starting we we started with the most difficult audience first, which is IT, right? Because we have so many backend systems that um, haven't been updated to use to a single sign-on. So uh, part of it is um, is a challenge to start with the the hardest use case first. But I think the good news is by the time we're done, we have a lot of champions there that are excited about the technology, and it's easier to actually roll up to the rest of the enterprise, which are easier use cases. And with that, that is all we have. So we'll open it up for questions if, uh, if folks want to know more about how we are actually doing this or more about the technology behind the scenes, we'd be happy to talk about it.